There's a lot going on in Australian deer hunting and in particular Samba deer hunting here in Victoria. There's lots of positives. We've got new opportunities for public land hunting. Hog deer hunting continues on Snake Highland, but there's also some controversy. Helicopters are culling deer for the first time here in Vic. Commercial shooters will soon be harvesting venison for sale and the Greens are pushing to lock us out of areas we're already hunting. All this and it's only a week until the polls open on a very important state election. I'm about to sit down for a chat with Barry Howlett, Executive Officer of the Australian Deer Association, to discuss these topics and more in what really is a very exciting time for hunters. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Very excited to be coming to you from our new purpose-built studio for this uh, first episode of our video and audio podcast. I think it's very appropriate that we're coming from Samba Central and we're talking about the number one deer in the Southern Hemisphere. And I've got Barry Howlett, a good friend of mine and a very, uh, very experienced man in this space in Victorian deer management, liaising with politics, discussing all things deer, particularly as we're coming to a exciting and um, fork in the road kind of moment for a Victorian deer hunting uh, in regards to access, deer management, deer numbers, but an exciting time, but also a, a time where hunters need to be very focused on their, I suppose, their concentrating their efforts and their priorities coming into an election. Are we three weeks out? Is that right? That's yeah, 24th of November. Three weeks out. There we go, coming in time. So we're going to give you a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a roundup on the election. Uh, Barry's going to touch on um, some of his thoughts for the election and moving forward and how um, political parties are going to um, benefit us or hinder us. But mostly, we're here to talk about the... Um, the exciting time that it is for Victorian deer hunters and some of the issues that have popped up recently and a whole lot has happened in the deer space over the last month. You've been a very busy man and I'm going to get straight into it with talking about um, the ADA in Australia has come a long way. I'm proud to have been a member for a Oh, two decades or something now and ADA got me started, offered a lot of help and ushered a young hunter like me in the right direction. Uh, I'm happy and proud to volunteer my time into things like uh, ADA hunter education and, um, and demonstrations, talks, things like that. But from your point of view, Barry, where has ADA come, what's its relevance and, and where is it going? Um, well, where we've come from, not far from here. So I started in Melbourne 50 years ago next year and come a long way and haven't moved very far at all um, in a way. The values that we started with in 1969 are still very much the values that we've got today. Mm -hmm. um, we're fortunate enough to be our great founder. There were, there were a number of men who started ADA, but our, our spiritual leader, if you like, was Arthur Bentley. Yes. Arthur literally wrote the book on deer in Australia and was just a great leader of men and instilled in our organisation a, a culture and a set of values that we still try to adhere to today, um, yeah. that we judge ourselves by. Mm -hmm. So that's where we've come from and where we hope we still are. Yeah. Um, our relevance today, hopefully for hunters, is as advocates for their interests. So whether you're a member of ADA or not, we're out there advocating for the interests of wild deer and of deer hunters. Now, what's the future for ADA? Uh, bigger and brighter, we hope. Yep. Um, we're moving into the 50th year is a really good time. We've just gone through some, some back end stuff, some constitutional change and moved to a board. And all that's focused on providing a better service for members, being more relevant to hunters across Australia. Because yep. uh, we've, we've reached a point over the last decade or so where we've stagnated, where we haven't been seen as relevant. Um, the, the deer scene moved an awful lot and we didn't. Yeah, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah at, at great pace and it kept us, it left us napping and Brian Murphy came and spoke, Brian's the CEO of the QDMA in the US, came and spoke to us about five years ago and basically said to us, you know, be relevant or die. So we're on a mission now to yeah. make sure that we're relevant, but to make sure that we're sticking to those values that Arthur gave us whilst being relevant. Well, well said, and I, as a member, I, 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 I totally agree that you're going in a very positive direction and revamped and sort of rebadged yourselves, if you like. And I, I, 
particularly when we're discussing the issues we've got here today, I don't think you could be more relevant. So we want to start with the positives. There's been some huge positives and gains and wins for Australian deer hunters, particularly Victorian deer hunters. We're very lucky down here in Victoria, the hunting state, to have so much public land access and be, and be saturated with opportunity, if you like. Let's take a step back. We're coming off um, the announcement that um, Snake Island, the hog deer ballot will continue. Let's just take a quick step back to where this started and you previously hit um, you know, huge blockages with, with, with balloted hunting on Snake Island. Yeah, certainly. And there's, ADA had probably three really serious tilts at getting access to Snake Island over about 25 years. Yeah, that were unsuccessful. Um, were unsuccessful. Ultimately, yeah. un well, one of them got to the point where the ballot was drawn and then it was scuttled. Um, one more recently, what, four years ago or something where we felt we'd put up a really good proposal, had done all the work yep. uh, and got killed by politics. Yeah, it's always there for the <laughs> yeah. that one, it was close, yeah. And then we came to, what, two years ago now, or three years ago now, I was in Parliament House talking to Daniel Young and Jeff Borman, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers MPs, and about, you know, the deer world and hunting in general. And the, the boys have asked me, oh, yeah, what can we do for you? Almost joking, taking, taking the piss a bit, what can we do for you? I yeah. said, oh, get us access to Snake Island. <laughs> Thinking that's not going to happen, you know, we'd only just come off pretty bruising defeat on it. Yeah. A um, few weeks later, I'm getting a call from their office saying, can you give us more info on this Snake Island thing? Yeah. And probably a month after that, I was sitting in Lisa Neville, who was the Environment Minister at the time, in her office with Jeff and Daniel discussing is this thing a goer? Can we do it? It all moved really quickly. Um, something, again, going back to those values. So Parks Victoria were in the room and they were keen to offer Snake Island to ADA as a deer control program. Yep. So to say, oh, you know, just keep everyone happy. We'll, we'll give you access, but no one else. And we rejected that straight away because that's, that's not what we're about. That's, yep. And you go back to... You know, That's what a very important note for people listening that the ADA isn't all about <laughs> themselves or accepting anything you can get. You know, you've got standards here. Well, you, exactly, yeah, we, we standards. Go back to what would Arthur Bentley say if we said yes to that. That's, so we had to remain pure and to the government's credit, they said, yep, fine, OK. Um, so we've got to go ahead sort of late that year. So that's sort of December. I ran into Lisa Neville in the street and she'd said, oh, we can do this thing. Yeah. And then we had to wait till August the next year. Yeah. So sitting on this secret and- uh, There was a and huge buzz around private <laughs> circles and people had flaked out sniffs. And I think I got a little leak at one point and but it was, oh, is it really gonna happen? And nothing, had, no one believed you Nothing's really. ever done till it's no, done. No, um, yeah. So, you know, waiting around till August and two months out from an announcement the environment minister changes, we've got to get the confidence of a new minister. Anyway, it happened August 2016. Yeah. We got an announcement, we've had two years. The first year there were 31 stags and nine hinds. There's been some beautiful, brilliant stags come off. Really the nice yeah. animals and... We've got some clips and some pictures I'll try to dub in. Most people have seen them all, but... And really good hunting experiences. So exactly. people, um, you know, Rhonda Hackett took her first yeah. free range wild deer on yeah. Snake Island. Yeah, uh, and Greg, long, Greg long Hogan, you know, you know from yeah. Beyond the Divide, uh, our cameraman, he's he company with his dad, Drew. You know, you can go, you can bring along a, a guest or an assistant yeah. on your hunt. Greg went along with his dad. His dad got a beautiful hoggy. You know, what more do you want? It is a world class experience. Yeah, it is. It's it's this ultimate wilderness hunting experience. There's no place like it. No. If you've ever spent some time on Snake Island, it's an extraordinary place. There's no place like it on Earth. So. There's been all these hunters, and look, it's it's the people who get drawn, so it's not everyone. But each year there's you know 40 deer being taken off there. It's about a third of what's legally taken hog deer in the world yeah. in any given year, yeah. a free range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, it's all free range. It's all free range. So it's it's greatly increased the the hunting opportunity, and not just the you, know, you can get there's private properties where you can get a better big hog deer stag but I doubt there's anywhere you can get that true wilderness hunting experience. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it's been a really, really positive thing. And fast forward to now, and the, the two year trial has uh, expired. Two year trial year. expired, it was a huge success. Yep. Um, by just about every measure, the, the Snake Island cattlemen 
who have opposed this forever, mm -hmm. for 25 years, yep. um, still moderately opposed to it, but even in the meetings where we're talking about, we've sat down with them, we sat down with them as soon as it was announced yep. and said, look, we, we're not out to hurt you, we want this to work for everybody. Um, and they've come back into the meetings and said, look, we've got to say that not a great deal went wrong. There are a few minor issues here and there and, and they brought them to attention, but they've been really respectful and honest and saying, yes, look, whilst we oppose it, whilst we wish it wasn't happening, we're not going to lie and, and say that it's this terrible thing when it's not. Yeah, yeah. and good honour for doing that. Yeah, I know how, how vigilantly they were opposed to it on a lot of yeah. sort of, you yeah. know... And our dealings with them, they've been honest with us. They're passionate people. They've got a different point of view and we've got to respect that. Yeah. Yeah. And we're all users of this public land. Um, so yeah, fast forward to a month or so ago, mm -hmm. um, we actually had the great pleasure of announcing that it's carrying on for at least another five years. Yeah, that's huge. And again, huge the first thing we did as soon as we made that announcement was ring the Snake Island cattlemen and, and reiterate to them yeah. that we'll try and make this work for you as best we can. This is, it was never an all or nothing thing. It was never an us or them thing as far as we were concerned. Um, hunters can coexist with other land users on public land. Victoria is an absolute showcase for that happening yeah. throughout the state. Yeah, yeah. And Snake Island shouldn't be an exception to that. Yeah. Well, congrats, mate. People really can't fathom the amount of work that's gone on behind the scenes over and over again. I bet you felt like it was Groundhog Day on a couple of those failures, but you know, credit and give credit to where it's, to where it's due to some of those MPs that helped out and got us yeah, over absolutely. the line. So again, another big feather in the cap for this exciting time that it is for the Australian deer hunter. Moving forward, uh, more, more land, extensions of public land hunting access. There's, uh, there's one big parcel up in the northeast, 90,000 hectares that's, av that's available. Yeah, so up Cobra Singaringi, right in the far east of the state. We've had 90,000 hectares added earlier this year. A um, few issues with that in that the maps didn't quite catch up, so there's been some problems with the private landowners because the maps that Parks put out when it was opened up were pathetic. Yep. Um, the deer hunting maps need to be updated, which is in process. I've heard a whisper that the yeah, GMA is in the process of doing the, that. They're yeah. getting there and what yeah. they've come up with is going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's very comprehensive. Um, yeah. But what came out did cause a few issues. But again, we've got this remote wilderness hunting experience that people are accessing and yeah, people, Dad's people here in the shop yeah. just got back from four days pack hunting and going around there. He took a really nice tag, he loved it. A lot of Brumbies up there. Yeah. Don't be in any uh, under any illusions. There's not a lot. Of, there's probably the lowest density of deer. I'm not saying that with any factual results or radio coloring program, but I've been up in that area myself. Daz just came back. He's a very experienced deer hunter, and he said, "Rob, I had to work my ass off to find we, those deer." We were involved. ADA were involved in um, pellet counts up in that area for probably a decade, yep. up until a few years ago, uh -huh. and it was real hit and miss finding deer up yeah. there then. Yep. Uh, certainly deer up there and some good samba up there, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, we'd have weekends where the folks were doing pellet surveys and all they were finding was pig sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad, Dad did take out a couple of pigs actually, so um, yeah. So there's another, and that's not a huge win, it's, it's a big area. These days, you've got to drive past a thousand deer to get yeah. there. That's, that, that's the kind of humorous thing about that access, but a huge parcel and another tick, uh, another tick in the box. But there's another 360,000 hectares, you're telling me, that's, that's potentially available. Yeah, so there was an issue, came up probably 20 years ago um, with people having grazing licences, so licences to graze cattle in state forests. Yes. Um, and there was some advice came out from the Victorian Government Solicitor at the time, it was 2001, that said that hunters with firearms mm -hmm. could be excluded from those grazing licences, had to have the permission of the licence holder to access. Um, not a lot happened with that. There were small parcels of land blocked off until just over a year ago when um, DELP, the mm -hmm. current name for the Environment Department, yep. pulled a couple of the deer hunting maps. So they directed GMA to pull a couple of maps on the basis that they were incorrect in DELP's view. Uh, when we contacted DELP officers and got the the replacement maps, they were marked up with huge areas of land, some of it land that I've been hunting personally for 20 years, um, that they were saying is now under off the grid, yeah. no longer available for hunting without the express permission of the licence holder. 
So that was like waving a red flag to ADA, basically. You said well, we, we had to then, so we'd been aware of the issue, like I said, for probably 20 years and it had been on the back burner and look, we've seen legal advice, not much we can do. Um, and you go off and you fight other fights. Because yeah. that came up, because it blocked off so many areas, and it wasn't because it was my little personal hunting patch yeah. there, because uh, it blocked off so many areas of places people were hunting and particularly where people were hunting with hounds and gun dogs. Yeah. So we always forget when we talk about access and what we we're talking about earlier with Cobras, great 90,000 hectares, but it's not accessible to people with hands and gun dogs. It's still access, aren't it? Yeah, correct. And that's really important that people with hands and gun dogs have good access too. So we went and engaged a, um, it was been reported in the Weekly Times as legal advice, it wasn't, it was policy advice from a consultancy called the Public Land Consultancy, right. who we've used before. And Public Land Consultancy is a, a team of associates and they're experts in public land policy. They're all ex-department people know the stuff back to front. So we went and said, can you cast your eye over this issue, give us advice on steps forward, thinking we're looking for steps to push for regulatory change to overcome this 2001 legal advice. Uh -huh. The advice that came back to us was, no, that legal advice is wrong. You should have had access to this land all along, uh, which we then put to the department and said, look, here's the advice we've got. They subsequently went and got advice that mirrors our advice. Yep, you're right, we're wrong. And now we're in an argy-bargy over them. Bureaucrats basically arguing, oh, well, this is our policy, and us saying, yes, but the law says differently. So, so where's that 360,000 acres sitting for the hunter on the other end of this today? Is it looking good? Um, it's looking good. It's legally accessible now. The problem is you've got the government department who administers it saying, oh, our policy is you can't access it. It's, it's this real grey area. Um, personally, I'll go and hunt it, and if someone wants to book me, I'll happily go to court on it. Yeah, gotcha. But that's not what we want. What we want is absolute clarity and maps that say you can hunt here and you can hunt there. We don't... Nobody wants to hunt. Yeah. No legitimate hunter wants to hunt looking over their shoulder. Yeah, exactly. Well, stay tuned to this space. That's a, uh, an avenue you're obviously pursuing. Hopefully get some results on that. Another issue that uh, I, I said off camera before, you know, we, 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 most of these deer issues, nearly all of them, I'm a glass half, half full kind of guy. A lot of people can see the glass half empty. The commercial use of venison uh, is something that Australia is so far behind the rest of the world in. It's, it's not funny. Um, I've been lucky to travel with hunting and everywhere you go in the world, bar here, you'll see venison as one of, and, and wild venison as one of the main key delicacies and most sought after and most highly expensive item on the menu. Um, in restaurants, uh, you, go to, you go to places like Canada, uh, Africa for example, in New Zealand, I've shot animals and been paid for them so they can go to the you know, to the butchery. I just got back from hunts in Sweden. The animals, uh, we literally get a photo with them. The guys, uh, you discuss your hunt. Um, a guy comes and collects them. You take them back to a cool room. You have to decide right then and there if you're keeping that animal because the butcher wants it now and it's going to into town to be served up as a delicacy. Uh, now, there's been a bit of banter on Facebook about this. Unfortunately, I've seen some negatives and social media. We want to set the record straight that Commercialisation of venison is a good thing, uh, particularly, particularly for the fight that we're that, not the fight, but winning over our anti, winning over our enemies, our, any of our opposition. We know that we can win the battle through their bellies. You know, yeah. inner city people. We discussed it. How do you get to an inner city person that doesn't think a deer or a deer hunter is a good thing? Yeah, absolutely through food. So, um, and we've had. Um, you've been to a dinner with us at a, at a really good restaurant in Melbourne where the chef's spoken about his desire yes. to serve wild shot game and he can't. Yeah. Um, there's quite a few of those chefs. I went to a lunch last year, Jesse Gurner at Bomber Bar in Lonsdale Street, which is a fan, you know, fantastic eatery. Yeah. And Jesse did a private meal for us and cooked up some fallow and some teal and it was just, Excellent. oh, it was off its head. <laughs> uh, and bemoaning the fact that he can't share this with the wild, you know, 
hipsters yeah. of Melbourne exactly. who, who, who would be beating his door down to come in and eat the, eat the stuff. And, and I can't think of, I've, got, I've lost count of how many hunts in New Zealand say, uh, you know, come out of Fjordland hunt and you, you've just been through everything that a Fjordland what ballot is and you're craving a feast and you go into Queenstown and you go to hit the menu at some beautiful restaurant and unfortunately, number one item is Fjordland wild venison and mussels. <laughs> you're like, well, I've just had enough of that after <laughs> six days, but I'll go for something else. But that's kind of what we're dealing with. So the commercialization of venison in Victoria or in Australia, let's focus on Victoria because there's a lot of outside regulations, but it's, it's happened in two stages as I see it. Initially, you were pushing for um, private, private use where you can take that to a butcher. Yeah. Yeah, that right? yeah and that was, there were two, two elements to what ADO was asking for and they sort of both developed separately. Mm -hmm. um, so for quite some time we've wanted this, been able to take our own wild shot game in, have it commercially processed for personal consumption. Yep. Which like you said happens all over the world. Um, New Zealand's got, I don't know how many, 900 or something licensed home kill butchers who will do that stuff for you. Yeah. Happens in the States, they drop it off. Exactly. Yep. Pay a processing fee and say, look, I'll take, I'll take all the really good stuff and can you send the ground, as they call it, mm -hmm. to the homeless? Yep. And pay the processing fee and homeless people get fed on yep. what the hunters don't want to... It happens all over the world. And you pick up your prepared cuts you pick that up look your like it's cuts. out of the Coles meat now, now, there's some people... I personally enjoy playing with the meat myself at home. I hope that didn't come out wrong. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I enjoy preparing the meat and, and working with it. But there's lots of blokes who are time poor or live in apartments yep. or, or just knowledge poor we get knowledge here, poor. You know, a guy will come in the shop here you early new experienced hunter went out and shot a samba made 200 kilos of sausages yeah. i find that funny <laughs> he thinks he's on a win but after Listen. after maybe 30 meals they're going to get a bit bland and you're going to look to yeah. do something different and and there's some bikes who just like hunting like eating them but preparing the meat just doesn't float their boat yeah so to have that option for them, and to have that option for them to do what Bob Goff was talking about, um, you emceed the Hunter's Dinner the other week where Bob Goff got his yep. life membership, and he was talking about venison diplomacy. Yes, yes. Um, so to be able to take really, really well prepared by a butcher meat to your friends, your non-hunting friends, yep. and present them this beautifully prepared, beautifully presented, tasty food, and have them eat really get into hunting that way there's real benefits in that for all of us oh yeah he nailed it exactly and i and i would have to admit the same thing i've won over quite a few people with a venison pie or a well-cooked roast or something yeah. they say is this really dear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it's it's harder for people to be people people have a visceral opposition to what we do without ever really thinking about it or understanding it yeah and having them understand an aspect of it through eating it breaks down those barriers. Totally. So that was the that was the initial that was the initial goal, yeah. and the secondary goal was well, outright commercialisation, commercialisation yeah. where uh, someone could be a pro shooter, take it to an abattoir, that abattoir yeah. upset, which and which was almost up. almost a separate goal, yeah. um, and that came through. We attend a lot of deer forums. There's areas in Victoria where deer are overabundant, where they're causing impacts on private land. And we were attending a lot of deer forums where farmers were talking about serious agricultural impacts and the problems they were having where they couldn't even, they were shooting lots and lots of deer. It's not like these deer weren't going to die. Yep. People shooting hundreds of deer a year, not even, even able to take them to the knackery under yep. Victorian food regulations. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't even take them to a rendering plant and get them turned into tallow under yep. Victorian food regulations having to bury them in pits, um, some of them running into, then running into issues with catchment management authorities and the EPA with like, this major problem, and deer can be a problem for people, this major problem with no seemingly straightforward solution when the answer was staring everybody in the face, which is allow someone to come on there, take these deer, process them, the farmer might even make a buck out of it. Everyone's a winner. and, and it's been a big turnaround for us because it's been something that ideologically our organisation would have been opposed to for most of the 50 years we've been in existence. Mm -hmm. Understood. And, and probably a part of the ethic that we've instilled in people. Um, and it's also part of that ethic about taking more deer yeah. 
you know, we used to instill, oh, limit your take and conserve the deer. And to a degree, we're trying to turn around a big, big ship here in a very short space of time. Yeah. Um, so I can understand why people... And I think that that's exactly where the public's getting confused as well. Yeah. They're not sure where they stand on the issue or the ethics or the morals of the issue. But the relevancy is exactly what you stated. And I can understand the angst for hunters and I can understand them struggling with that di dichotomy of this, this valued game animal that we respect and this overabundant animal that's causing unwanted impacts that needs to be fairly heavily managed in some places. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about... We're not talking about guys heading up into the bush and, and spotlighting and bringing, bringing out semi-trailers of deer. We're talking about um, licensed professional operators like kangaroo shooters, yeah. like pig hunt shooters that um, have a, go through a very strict, thorough process to obtain their license. They've got to have strict protocols on how they take their deer, how they're processed, um, how they're hung, how they're butchered. They've got to have uh, specialised vehicles. and. And got, same, people can see the negative, but uh, these guys aren't going to be breaking the rules if it's their livelihood. And these these numbers, the bulk of this take, if you're trying to pull out a 300 kilo animal, you're not going to go and do it from the middle of the of the Alpine National no, Park no. or something. It doesn't pay the bills. You're going to be doing it from the fringe areas when you where you can ex easily access these animals and get it processed and get the job done. Yeah. And they these aren't these numbers and this take isn't affecting the hunter and their opportunities in the bush. In the state They're going to be taking the cream off the top in the places where deer are impacting on people. Mm. And yeah, I don't foresee there being a problem with us finding deer to hunt in the state of Victoria. And it's actually, it's, hunters are seen as we get this when we talk about deer management strategies and we get this from landowners. Well, what are you worried about? You'll still have deer to hunt. We're seen as this these one dimensional people who that's all we care about. Well, yeah. uh, from our perspective, we do care that that deer are having a negative impact on people. We don't want to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to be, we certainly can't use our ideology to block people mm -hmm. from running their enterprise how they want to run it. Yeah, yeah understood. So the, the, two clear, the two clear goals there and the two clear policies, if you like, were, or, you know, or outcomes was, Private, private use through a through a registered butcher, yeah. and then and then all out commercialisation of venison. The, the, they've swapped in reality, and the commercialisation has come the, through. They did, yeah. Um, the commercialisation could be done by um, a mechanism called a governor and council order, so it didn't have to go before parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government can basically change regulations by getting the governor of the state to sign off on them, yeah. and then the parliament has a set amount of time and. I'll get it wrong, but at 30 days, say, to disallow those regulations or it stands. Whereas the stuff for the non-commercial harvest, so for me, Joe Hunter, to take my meat to a commercial premises, get it processed, mm -hmm. required some regulation change. Yes. That went through in a bill, a primary industries amendment bill that had a heap of other stuff in it. Um, it was what's called an omnibus bill and it had a heap of stuff from a heap of acts. And that bill got amended in the upper house and for the right reasons, but as a consequence of those amendments, there was things that the government couldn't live with, so it ended up dying. Gotcha. Um, so it never actually got through in this parliament that's just finished. Right. So the thing we thought would have been in in March this year hasn't happened, and the thing we thought probably wasn't going to happen until later has. So. Okay. Well, we can summarise on that with it being a good thing for deer hunting, a good thing for ven for venison, a good thing for the deer, and a good thing for hunters. Yeah. Let's. I think you could both agree that we wouldn't be more proud to be able to go into Melbourne and order venison off the menu. And let's just hope this happens in our lifetime. Um, a part of the success of that, I think, and we're probably buying our own trumpet, is um, ADA along with Field and Game. When the action plan came out, we went to Minister Pulford and said, "What's the accountability around it?" Um, and got the response sort of, what do you mean? And we said, well, who's providing accountability to make sure these things happen? Yes. Uh, and we quickly, when we realised there was none, we said, look, we'll write key performance indicators, if you like, yeah. and we'll hold them accountable. And to her credit, she agreed. Yeah. We ran the KPIs past her, uh, got no disagreement from her. So we've started publishing them every three to six months. Mm -hmm. 
um, in our publications, there's a, a joint publication, we do a field and game conservation and hunting that just goes to pollies. And when the first one of those dropped, I got phone calls from bureaucrats unhappy. What's this? It's all wrong. Mm. Well, the minister agreed to it. Yeah. Oh, well, you've got to change it. Oh, well, that, that's fine. You tell your minister to call us and if she wants it changed. Uh, that reaction was priceless to us because yeah. it showed that they really didn't like the accountability yeah. Yeah. and that it was really important. So that accountability is now making sure people do those actions because if they don't, there's these pains in the ass. these little organisations who are putting out stuff out publicly, making them look bad. Yeah. Um, so that's something we've done that's been really positive. The Sustainable Hunting Action Plan for people, if, if guys are hunters, guys and girls are getting a bit complacent with maybe what they think, that there's nothing happening with the GMA, I urge you to log on. You can download that yeah. document, can't you? The Sustainable Hunting Action Plan can be downloaded. And if you think uh, nothing's going on or it's a quiet day, download that document, have a look at it and just see the amount of stuff that's on there. And it's all a positive direction. And so the time frame on that, was that, is that um, the four year plan you spoke about? Yeah. Where are we in that four years? Halfway through. Um, we've done some analysis on it just the other day, did an update on our KPIs. Mm -hmm. And pretty well half the, it's pretty well halfway through. That's on track? Yeah, yep. yeah, and it, it started off pretty slow, but um, a lot of these big ticket items, the mapping, the signage, are all rolling out or will be rolled out by early next year. So it's looking like it's on track, which is really encouraging. Mm -hmm. And where we're going to get to in this space shortly is uh, it's, it's very important that people understand that the GMA has nothing to do with the parks and cull that's going on at the moment. There's some unfair yeah. slander being hurled at them and it's a Parks Vic operation. It's not uh, operatives or employees of GMA it, getting out of it. It's probably difficult for hunters because GMA is their point of contact with government. Yes. And look, GMA's got its problems. It's, it's not well enough scope to do the enforcement it needs to do. It's not well enough resourced. Um, from our perspective, there's some really good people in there doing some really good work. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, GMA gets seen by hunters as everything's their fault because that's, they're the ones they pay the licence fee to. Yeah. So that's their interface with government. But the reality is GMA don't manage the land Parks Victoria or Delp do. And a lot of these things that go on that hunters are less than happy with aren't GMA, it's Parks Victoria or Delp. And that, that's a great segue into what we, we're going to discuss now. So while we're, we are talking about the positives, and it's been great to roll out, and, the, and there's endless, almost endless positives for this great time to be a Victorian hunter, we do have some negatives. As I spoke about, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, but I really can't see anything positive coming about for the first time in my life and our life seeing helicopters flying in the Alpine National Park and culling sand and deer. And this is... Uh, this is a very interesting fork in the road. I think we've progressed as, uh, as deer hunters and deer numbers have grown. There's no facts on it. We don't have any hard evidence. There's no radio collars. There's no huge funding put into uh, to numbers. And there's this one million deer number that's just that's here, so it's just been thrown around. And uh, we'd be lying if we said we didn't know we were going in in that direction but we've come to this fork in the road and what that fork in the road is I don't know it's really a metaphor for a helicopter with gun with rifles shooting out of it or it's um, deer management or w with hunter access or it's uh, the issue just quietly goes away I don't think it's gonna go away um, importantly from an ADA point of view as a member uh, I, I can't say how proud of of you, uh, I say you, but how, how proud of um, ADA we are as members that ADA stepped back from this, from highly successful programs like Yelling Bow, where deer management and, and culling has gone on and there's been all the animals recovered and it's been a huge success for everyone involved. And then, you know, why you've pr pride, proud you know, prided yourself on being involved in these management issues and being at the forefront of it, you had the balls when this came up to say, this is not cool, this is not ADA, we're having nothing to do with it, basically. Yeah. Stepping away from it. Yeah, and look, we've been keen to put accountability around it. Um, we took a view early on that we weren't in a position to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't want to see it happen. We weren't in a position to stop it. 
uh, I think Parks Victoria essentially just buckled to expectations. So I was going to ask you where it came from, is that where you think it came from? Yeah, I think from? there's an expectation by loud helicopter culls, helicopter culls. And if you look at it, there's been no clear upfront. So before they did the cull, they didn't say, it was always, oh, this is a trial to see if we can shoot deer from a helicopter wall. Yeah, of course you can, they've shot thousands of them in New South Wales. Exactly, and New Zealand, from yeah, a New South Wales been doing, New Zealand's been doing um, for decades, yeah. There was no, nothing clear about how they're going to measure it, so we want to, uh, here's a negative impact on the environment. We're going to take the helicopter gunship in here, kill these deer, and we're going to measure it by saying that impact's been addressed. There was none of that. We've seen reporting come out post-cull um, saying deer per minute flown or something and yeah you and I were bouncing around some interesting figures weren't we so and, and you'll do a follow-up on this on this watch this space because you're attending a meeting next week is that right with yeah, parks with you've us. asked now did you get invited or you've asked well we've asked we've said we want full transparency on this financial yeah. transparency transparency on the vets we've got a, an awful lot of questions we asked a lot of questions beforehand mm -hmm. and we've probably got more questions to ask now that it's happened than we asked beforehand well, we, I mean, I as a hunter, you want, I see the commercial use of venison, commercialisation, that's a great way to control numbers on those fringe areas where I know that the numbers are brewing. You know, if you want to find big numbers of deer, you don't go into the middle of, of Howard and you don't go to the middle of Cobras or somewhere. You go to Eildon, you go to the fringes, you go to Alexandria, you go to Healesville, you, you go to you know, southwest Gippsland on those fringes where the numbers are, are high and dense. Now, I want to see Samba hunting and, and numbers controlled as much as anyone else, and I see a, I see a very, very you know, valuable place for it and a, um, and a necessary place for it. But I see this as, as an, an unnecessary expense, as an unnecessary action. Sure, it's shooting deer. I, I'm not worried about deer. That I, not, I'm not worried about them taking away deer that I might have hunted, yeah. but I just don't see it as a positive outcome at all or a necessary one. And we've, I've been in helicopters in New Zealand. We've got, uh, I know what a squirrel costs to fly. We're talking, we're just throwing around some numbers of what this cost in Now you saw a Weekly Times article today that said something cost. Yeah, you know, 125 a deer or something. Which, 125 dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, which doesn't. Um, <laughs> we're talking thousands. We're talking a squirrel. A helicopter for a day, you know, jet turbine helicopter for a day. We had you had one shooter, you had an observer. Yeah, and a vet running around separately, I believe. Plus, on the ground, following GPS. I believe, marks. Yeah. So how does that work? Oh, well, I think so. Vets plus, are pretty cheap, aren't they? Plus, oh, yeah, yeah. Ask uh, my Labrador. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for how many days did this operate? Five days, I think. Four right. or five days. Plus, plus all the admin that parks we oh, had to put there's around. There's no way this change out of hundreds. Uh, hundreds of thousand dollars yeah, plus. It's, it, it will have been a very expensive exercise. And was it 118 deer? A hundred, well... You quoted Doug. Doug, <laughs> Doug, Doug Reed had a really good thing on Facebook yesterday where he cited it as 118 proper deer and yeah. a fellow. <laughs> um, we'll get in trouble with the Tasmanians yeah, now. Yeah, we will. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I got you, so 118. 118 yeah. Samba and one fellow. And I think the thing that sticks in most people, people don't like the wastage of meat. Um, Nobody likes shoot to waste. No. I think the thing that sticks in most people's craw about this trial is that it's not well justified beyond being, oh, we're going to see if we can do it. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, there's no there, prior there's consultation, no, was there? You know, on our Facebook page today, we've got some pictures of a, an alpine bog we hiked up to three years ago and helped Parks Vic put a fence up yep. to stop sandball wallowing, and the recovery is fantastic. And that was an expense, that was a $10,000 exercise mm -hmm. to helicopter the gear in there. Now, uh, am I uh, right? Exactly that. Uh, uh, but that was well justified, and you can see, you can measure results. This culling that's just gone on, there's no measurable results other than we killed X amount of deer. Yeah, and the timing of it was not great. Uh, again, why, another reason why you stepped away for, on behalf of your members was it wasn't a good outcome for hunters with the opening of the gate. Yeah, oh, that, was, that, was a separate, that was a different program. Sorry. So there was a, um, Parks Vic wanted to do a program week, week and a half ago yes. at Howlett. Uh, so we're involved in these alpine deer management programs and most of them are in areas that are closed to rec hunting. And our normal argument is you should try the treatment by just allowing rec hunters in, targeting rec hunters to the problem. Then there's this program on Howlett which 
we did become involved in the first year it was on. They've come back for a repeat go this year and it's, we looked at the dates and they're a week before the gates open. Um, it's a really prized hunting spot. There's going to be a heap of hunters in there taking a heap of deer. Yeah. So there's no, and again, no real good measurements of what the impacts are. Mm -hmm. So it's quite conceivable that the wreck hunters a week later would just take the same amount of deer that would have been taken anyway. Yeah. We weren't prepared to send our blokes in to basically wreck someone else's recreational hunting opportunity without there being a really good environmental yeah. outcome. An iconic location at an iconic time yeah. and, a, and a hunt that's that's emotionally means more to a lot of blokes than getting a deer. Yeah. It's about the, being up on top of the gates open you know, and, getting, and getting into Howard. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, is this mostly around alpine bogs? Is this issue around focused around the, the damage to wallowing to alpine bogs? Yeah, in those that Howard program and, and that one up on Buffalo, Bogong certainly yeah. are, yeah. and it's undeniable. And look, if you look at that post on our Facebook page today, mm -hmm. the impact of wallowing on some of those bogs exactly. is is undeniable. pretty extreme, undeniable. Um, yeah. We can't sit here and say that. I think we say in that post most of the places where you'll find deer, their impacts benign, but that's not always the case. But if I drop in with a backpack and go down to the bottom of X River, wherever, um, I'm seeing. Oh, yeah. and they're not, they're not in there getting yeah. jumpers, so. Through most of the inhabited range, the impact's benign. Yeah. But it's, it's silly to deny that there's these places at the extremes where they're having a really serious impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I was up the northeast holidaying with the family at Easter, you know, and the farm was saying the same thing, Rob, would you come up and, and, and knock these in winter? And, and, and I said, look, it's Deer culling, I'd love to help you out, mate. Deer culling really isn't my thing. I could, it's not enjoyable for me. Yeah. It's about the hunt, it's not about taking numbers. But he was in the position where he needed numbers off his silage crop, but what tormented him most was the wastage, which yeah. was prior to this commercialisation. So, yeah, well, um, we've, again, unfair, a lot of unfair um, angst directed at GMA regarding the helicopter culls. Let's surmise to say it's not GMA, it's Parks Vic. Parks Vic are uh, a bit out on their own. Um, we'll yeah, just... I, I doubt GMA would have been involved. I don't know, but they get the permits from DELP, so yeah. there's probably not a great deal GMA would have been involved with that all, even at an administrative scale mm -hmm. of that. It certainly wasn't their idea. Yeah. Well, watch this space. It will be interesting to follow up with you after your meeting next week to see uh, who uh, who terms it a success and a success and what factors is deeming it a success. I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you we'll get told it was a success. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the it, Greens, the Greens are spinning it a bit uh, in their way as well, aren't they? How are they using this to further their agenda? Yeah, and it's it's a long-standing agenda basically that recreational hunters are no good, that you need to pay professional hunters and I know a few blokes who are paid deer controls, you probably know a few blokes. This seems to be an impression amongst the Greens movement that these blokes don't enjoy their work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they really, yeah, really yeah, do. Yeah. Um, but calling in the, and this is where, this, this goes back to a bit of a, an ethic thing that I just constantly talk to hunters and reinforce. When you defend hunting, defend, defend hunting for the right reasons because you enjoy it. You enjoy everything about it. You enjoy the hunt, you enjoy the stalk. We love taking you know, a big chunk of bone as much as anyone, but at the end of the day, we love the hunt. It's all about the hunt. Now, you've got to defend the hunt because you love it. If you defend it on a pest species, if someone like now says, okay, we're gonna ban recreational hunting and we're bringing in the professionals, you can't stand up and go, but hey, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, but no, you, you, def you can't defend it because you enjoy it later. You have to defend it because you enjoy it now. That's the only defence for hunting, yeah, it, for all those absolutely. reasons. It's something we've always been clear about. Yes, it can have an environmental benefit. Mm. And there's absolutely areas where yeah, 100,000 deer taken by wreck hunters in Victoria a year, sex bias towards females. It's undeniable that that's having benefits in population control and environmental, but our argument is always that hunting is a legitimate use of public land.
it's safe and legitimate and that we can coexist with other public land users and that's why you should allow it. Totally, totally. So let's not, uh, the, the, the bank on the professionals, bringing in the professionals, uh, where, where is this huge bank of um, professionals? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, A, A, they're not there. Yeah. And B, it's just not economically feasible. We did a, um, there was a Victorian Parliament inquiry a couple of years ago into invasive wildlife, which includes deer in some areas. And I was lucky enough to give evidence after Andrew Cox, who's the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. Now the Invasive Species Council's a really official sounding name, but it's actually just a green lobby group. Yeah. And Cox had proposed to the politicians holding this hearing that all wildlife control in Victoria, all deer hunting should be paid professionals. So given that as evidence, and then I got my hearing and had that put to me by one of the MPs, Andrew Cox was on before you, Barry, he said it should be paid professionals. And I just turned and said, that's great. And did he nominate which hospital he was gonna close down to pay for it? <laughs> Laughter, oh, yeah. oh, they laughed. The, the police laughed because they got it that, let's be real here. How much money are you going to, how much money is a government going to spend? And this is part of the problem with, um, you see it a lot now from farming groups, and I get it, they're struggling, they're struggling with drought. Yeah. You get people saying, do you need to be declared a pest? Do you need to be declared a pest? And, and when you push them on their motivation, there seems to be a belief that if deer were declared a pest, that government would somehow come and help them mm -hmm. with their problem. Yeah. That's never been the case no, in, in no. this country. It's an expense to them. It's just, yeah. Call them whatever name you want, yep. the, the impacts aren't going to change. No, if they call it a pest and then they make it policy that, or, or law that you've got to control. <laughs> they'll they'll put the onus back on the exactly. landholder, the government's not coming to your help. So two weeks ago, I understand you attended the Vertebrate Pest Symposium for a thrilling holiday. <laughs> yeah, Tell me yeah, what that was all about. Um, I, yeah, I just actually went over to the SHOT Show in Perth for three days of rain there. So I flew over to Coffs Harbour for three days of rain there, all while it was beautiful sunshine at home in Victoria. Um, and it, look, it's a, every two years they hold this symposium in New South Wales and it's basically the land managers and the academics talking about wildlife management. Um, they deem it pest management, which is a term we don't use, but wildlife management mainly in New South Wales, but more broadly. Who attended on behalf of deer hunters? Me. Um, yeah, so three days of talks, three days of presentations, and only one perspective from recreational hunting at all. It's a bit sad, isn't it? it it's a worry. Um, it's good to get our story across, and our story went across really well. Yeah. Um, was well received by the academics, and we were always really careful to, to deal in facts, to deal in data, not to put emotion in. We told the story of the um, deer control programs we've been doing at Yellingbow. Yes. And the Yarra Rangers here for a few years and what a great success they've been yeah. both in hunter and community engagement but ultimately great success in tree species are, have been able to grow. And they were the first of their kind. Th that, those programs yeah. were, yeah, peri-urban, um, surrounded land, these little reserves that are surrounded by farmland. Really difficult environment to operate in and run by some really good people at Parks Victoria, really good local rangers, one bike in particular who's knows deer yeah. inside out, really got his head around deer and knows hunters yeah. inside out. Yeah. And they just made it work. And there's two critically endangered wildlife species, Victoria's terrestrial emblem, emblem which is the Leadbeater's possum, yes. and our avian emblem, which is the helmeted honey eater, um, both in that reserve. It's the only wild population left of the helmeted honey eater. So really important that these trees are able to grow and it yeah. was antler rubbing and browsing that were stopping that from happening. And that's just been this huge success because those trees have been able to take off. Yeah. Uh, we're still killing deer there and we... And this was ADA volunteers? Volunteers. And all meat being recovered? Pulling the meat out, using, sharing the venison with each other. Um, and deer are going to keep coming in. It's the nature of that reserve. It's a small, all this private land. Deer are going to keep pouring into it. Mm -hmm. So it's a sustained effort. It's going to be for the foreseeable future. So anyway, I went up there to tell that good story yes. about how 
recreational hunters can be involved in these really targeted controlled programs. Yeah. It went over pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And were there any negatives raised or, you know, was... a lot of negatives and a lot of um, what we class demonisation of yes, deer. That's what I meant to say. Um, so there's people everywhere around the country now, people talk about the threat of deer as a foot and mouth disease vector and stuff like that which is really, really low, and all the scientific literature says it's not, it's not even on the radar. Mm. But you get otherwise serious academics, you know, the CEO of the Natural Resources Commission in New South Wales standing up there saying it as if it's true because it suits an agenda. Yeah, gotcha. So that was another important part of being there was being able to be one of the people putting your hand up and yeah, saying... Yeah, just be able to rebut. Yeah, we, we, yeah, people need to be accountable for what they say. Yeah. We certainly are. We're, we're this little minority social position, mm -hmm. and every word we say we get held to account for, which is yeah. fine, yeah. but everyone else needs to be accountable as well. Yeah. So some positives to come out of that? Yeah, look, some good talks, some good relationships, and land managers from other states coming up saying, hey, can we talk about this? Perhaps we could use rec hunters in our state. Mm -hmm. So demystifying who we are and what we do, I think it's, it's very positive for us to to keep going there and respectfully telling our story. Yeah, okay. Well, another subject that's come up in the news of late is um, native land title. And yeah. in particular, uh, traditional owners, I, I gather, uh, uh, the way I read it from the press conference is that uh, a huge chunk of Victorian land and um, a, a great part of that is our public state forest and Alpine National Park area that's been allocated for um, for, for, for deer hunting is going to be um, handed back to traditional owners, which is, which is a great thing. How potentially, if and when, or does it at all uh, impact deer hunting? Um, short answer is we don't know, but there's risk in everything. Um, we've had experience with one of these already. Uh, Gippsland Lakes Coastal Park is part of a fair chunk of the parks in Gippsland all the way through to Tara Bulga. Well, I understand it's been a big success though. Yeah, yeah, so that's, this is the uh, Good Eye Kern Eye um, joint management plan with Parks Victoria and we were involved in that process and they've come out with extending the areas for belted hunting on Bull Pool. Um, we've actually gained not a heap of access but we didn't lose any, um, includes the Mitchell River National Park where we have stalking access. Yeah, it gains a gain. We, uh, we gained a tiny bit of access for that ballot area in Bull Pool which is important to that ballot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so our, our early experience has been that it's been quite positive. We haven't had any great issues dealing with the traditional owners. Uh, probably find them more pragmatic in some senses than the traditional land managers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also downsides to that. We've had looking at doing some research um, and part of the research with trail cameras is putting bamboo stakes in the ground as distance markers with marks on them yeah. and struggling to get permits to put them in the ground on co-managed land because um, it's disturbing an indigenous site. Okay. So there's some, some scary bureaucracy that goes with these things. Right. But I wouldn't be running around saying the sky is falling just because there's native title. Um, gotcha. Our experience isn't that. Okay, well that, that's a good thing. Now to kind of uh, head this out, mate, as we uh, mentioned at the top of the, of, the, of, the, of the interview, if you like, the, we're a few weeks out from election. Um, Politics, dealing with politicians, is a huge part of, of your daily life. Uh, working with ADA, you do a great job working with politicians and continually advocating for hunters. Um, there's, there's people against us out there. We have, our, we have our enemies, if you like. Coming into the election, I say it to, to summarise it in a few ways. Um, you've got um, the Greens, as you said, are ideologically against recreational hunters. Yeah. Um, is it a no-brainer that anyone who... I mean, coming into election, let's, let's put this into perspective. Uh, we've both got families, we've got young kids. You've got to vote on a number of reasons and you exactly might be a hospital, health-based, education-based, whatever. But um, I also vote with a strong, you know, um, angle towards hunting and, and who's looking yeah. after me in a recreational outdoor space. So if you're focusing on that, and we think you should be uh, conscious of that, is the Greens, what, do they offer any positivity, 
to any benefit to us at all? Sadly, no. Um, and I say sadly, no, because there should be a heap of common ground with a political movement that's focused on the environment yeah. and nature yeah. and most a lot of the value there's an awful lot of shared values theoretically, theoretically theoretical with values. with hunters and the greens there should be an awful lot of common ground but sadly there's this pure ideology and, and a part of the trickery of the greens of course is that their domain is wealthy inner urban yeah they're so people. removed from uh, they're, they're, they're so removed from yeah. the the people who I fundamentally disagree with but can kind of respect who are sitting up in trees on a mountain somewhere trying to do a blockade yeah. are far removed from the wealthy yuppies in Fitzroy who are voting for the Greens. Gotcha. Okay. And their policies are geared towards the wealthy yuppies, not towards the hippie in the tree. Yeah. So you've, you've nailed a hit the hammer on the head there, you've nailed it, it's pretty obvious that there's nothing in the Greens camp that are going to benefit us or assist it. One of the things they're steering towards is the issue of the Great Forest National Park. Uh, where is this at? Is it going away? Is it going, gaining momentum? At the moment, it's sort of stalled. It's not going anywhere, but it's certainly not going away. Which is away. The people who are advocating for it um, are well resourced, they're sincere, and they're quite effective advocates. And this is over the timber, and this is over this is over the forests and uh, and the possum again. Yeah. Oh, fundamentally, it's it's anti-logging. Yeah. At, at its core, this is an issue with forestry. Yeah. Um, I'll be unkind and say I think the possum was convenient. Yeah. Um, and that's that tends to happen with environmental movements. You, people will they'll find a cute fluffy creature. Yeah. I'm not downplaying no. the plot but of the there possum. There was a bit of science brought out on that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the possum thing's been convenient, but these people are, they're fair dinkum. And this isn't some flash in the pan, they're not going away. It's gonna be a threat for the foreseeable future. Now you outlined to me, at this, uh, again off camera, the, the threat here is that once it gains park classification, the precedent is that we've never had hound hunting. Yeah, and that's, that's the real challenge from a deer hunting perspective. So we don't, whilst we might be sympathetic to forestry, to logging, that's an industry and that industry can stand on its own two feet. From our perspective, our issue with a change in land classification is that we lose access for hunting. Yeah. And that's what we're about is access for hunters for hunting. And something I think I touched on earlier that gets lost when you're talking about, oh, it's great, we've got all this extra park to hunt is that it's not extra land for hound hunting or for hunting with gun dogs. And that's really and this important. area is a huge heartland for hound hunting. Uh, it's Big River and, and all of those, Eildon and all of those iconic mm. um, hound hunting places. Some great, some really good country, some absolute thick mongrel, <laughs> horrible yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. too. Yeah, I found but, some of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got great memories from hunting a lot of that country. Yeah. Coming into the election, who's 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 playing for the national, the great national, this proposed Great Forest National Park, and who's playing against it? Uh, Shooters, Fishers, and Farmers Party are on the record as vehemently opposed. Yes. Uh, the coalition have voted for a prohibition on it, so I'd say they're on the record as will not do it. Uh, Labor Party haven't stayed their position on it. Right. Do you think they will before the election? I doubt it. Right. Um, and there'd be. There'd be two schools, in the, there'd be people in the Labor Party, same in the Liberal Party, mind you, who are in favour of it, and people in the Labor Party who are well and truly against People like the CFMEU are well and truly against it. Gotcha. Um, so that's an interesting space. Mm -hmm. And the Greens obviously are all in favour. So what, what can we offer for viewers uh, advice on an election? Do you want to wait? Uh, watch this space? Is yeah, still we're, we're, still, we're still dealing with the politicians now. And look, ADA's traditional stance one that we are wavering from and one that we aren't. So traditionally we've gone and put out um, advice on different people in different seats and this person, regardless of is a good person, so vote for them. Um, we've come to the conclusion that that doesn't really achieve anything because of party discipline in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Australia's probably got the, well, has the most disciplined parties in the free world. People never cross the floor. If they do, it's only ever symbolic. So the good person in a bad party is actually no good to us. Yes. 
Yeah, that's um, a very that's a very poignant point. So we've moved away from that, and what we'll be doing, which we have traditionally done, is giving a really good analysis on where each party stands on a range of issues mm -hmm. that are important to hunters. Uh, what they say they're going to do, what they have done, and what the prospect of them carrying that out is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And leaving hunters to make up their own minds. We're going to trust your intelligence and we're going to trust that, as you said, for different people it's going to play in different ways. Um, if you've got a, if you're under mortgage stress, your priority is going to be different than someone who isn't. We, we don't expect hunting to be the only influencer of your vote. For sure, for sure. Well, I think I think it's a good time to um, to wrap this up, mate. We've uh, we've had a great discussion. I uh, thank you for your time. I think we've put a bit of um, we've put out a few spot fires. I think in people maybe um, getting their knickers in the knot about some things that perhaps uh, they might have been a bit blown a bit out of proportion. There are some issues there. Might have started a few spot fires. Yeah, we might. Have, yeah, well, hopefully not true. Uh, let's. Uh, but let's focus on this. Is such an exciting time for, for hunters. Yeah. This, oh. is the, this is the golden era of hunting. Yeah, right now. these are. If you're a, these are the good old days. Yeah, exactly. You got yeah. in Victoria eight and a half million hectares of public land. The vast bulk of that that you can walk into 365 days a year, no bag limit. No. Just buy a license, go and. Uh, there are few places on earth that have it as good as we've got it. We've got to fight hard to protect it and improve it, but there are a few places on earth that have got it as good as we've got it. And, yeah, you know, overabundance of deer is a bit cool too, because yeah. yeah. there's lots of deer around. Yeah, and there'll be hurdles. <laughs> and, 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 and being an ADA member, having guys like yourself in the ADA, you're, uh, you're seeing these hurdles and you're either jump over them, jump through them, go around them, whatever we've got to do to keep going in a positive direction. Yeah, we. Look, we're having the fight. Um, I'd love to sit here and say we win it all the time. We don't. We, we have our failures. Yeah. Um, and I hope that we're honest about that and that we front up and say, hey, we got this wrong or, hey, look, we had this fight and lost. Because that's important too, to let people know that you know, we don't win every fight. That's just not the way the world is. Um, the more of you that join and the more of you that resource us, the, the more fights we'll win. But. So where to, where to, for, to viewers and listeners from now, uh, go to the ADA website? Yeah, ADA Facebook page at the moment is probably the best thing. We've got a new website coming next year that we're working on that's going to be really good. It's, um, it's a multimedia thing. It's going to sort of change the way we communicate. But yes. at the moment, we've got a website that's pretty steam driven. And the best place to get information is our Facebook page. And you'll be running constant updates and um, election guides coming into the election. We will, yeah. We'll be putting that analysis out as soon as we can because the early voting's a significant part of the votes nowadays and that starts Monday coming. There you go. So we'll be trying to get some good information out before then and we've told the parties that if you haven't got good policy to us before then, what we're putting out is going to look bad. Mm -hmm. But we're going to update that too as it updates. Yep. And for all hunters out there, whatever you do, any hunter hunting public land, being an advocate for deer hunting, self-regulation and being a member of a hunting organisation like ADA is crucial in putting our voice forward. And your membership is, is everything to guys like, uh, to, to organisations like ADA. I encourage you to join up if you're not. The value is clearly there on all fronts, whether it be attending branch hunts, be it be coming to branch nights, or just literally, um, being uh, being a paid member, being a voice, and um, resting easy, knowing that guys like Barry are fighting the fight. Uh, moving forward into next year, we've got a new Deer Expo coming up. Yeah, Wild Deer Expo at Sandown at the end of March, which mm -hmm. should be exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and ADA is going to have our 50th anniversary dinner at that expo as well. So, fantastic. A bit of celebration, and again, trying to just a little bit of celebration. Yeah, a little bit of celebration. <laughs> trying to honour the past, but also trying to look forward, see what the next. The last 50 years are really important, but what's most important is the next five or ten. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, thanks for your time, mate. I look right, forward cheers, to Rob. being a part of it. Thanks.